Greetings, greetings, and welcome to Weirwood Compendium number nine. Nine, that's right. Weirwood Compendium nine, it's a big day. Resurrecting the Weirwood Compendium. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you all watching live for hanging tight. I started a tiny bit late, as is, as is my custom, let's be honest. <coughs> hmm. All right, we are starting at 4.20. West Coast time, and I have my uh, have my lumberjack gear on because we are, of course, going deeper into the woods than we ever have before. Woo! It's going to be fun. Hopefully, you guys tuned into our live stream this past Tuesday, where we went over all the weird compendium stuff that we've gone over so far, basically, in the whole series. Today is going to be a scripted podcast day which means I have about 9,000 9, words of a scripted episode, which is a good, good sizable episode here. Um, we will always be taking Super Chats and PayPal.me Mythical Astronomy donations, of course. Uh, it will help me if your questions are vaguely somewhat related to the topic at hand. Uh, but if you have a burning question that you just have to ask, you can send that in too. And uh, yes, really, really appreciate that. Keeping me going right now with these PayPal.me Mythical Astronomy donations. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah. A Patreon, yeah, absolutely. The best place to support me long term. No question. Um, but some people do prefer the one-time donations. Uh, and it is kind of a fun way if you have an immediate question and you want to get an answer. So those of you who may see the title of this episode as uh, uh, You Will Fly Still can actually just click refresh on your browser. The reason we started late is because I was changing the title and the artwork of the episode. It is now Shamanic Thunder Horse. Um, I chopped a little bit of the brand stuff off for Weird Compendium 10, which I'll probably call the Stallion Who Mounts. And we're gonna do a little more Dunk and Egg today. So I went with Shamanic Thunder Horse. As you can see, this is the Dunk Sigil, the falling star and tree. And we're gonna talk about the symbolism behind that sigil today. Thanks for everyone sending me warm greetings there in the chat. Nice to see y'all. It's fun to hang with you uh, three times this week, cranking out the weirwood material. So thanks for joining me. And that being said, oh, there's a Discord link if you want to get in on that. And yes, we are definitely going to talk about Dunk the Lung today. Hmm. Shamanic Thunder Horse sounds like a great stoner metal band, more like an over-the-top stoner metal band. But maybe that's, uh, maybe all <laughs> stoner metal bands are a little over-the-top. Yes, like my boy's high on fire. So, hey there, friends and patrons and mythheads of the lands. It's Lucifer means Lightbringer, and today is a big day. We are resurrecting the Weirwood Compendium, which we haven't added to since late 2018. So if you're watching live, I hope you've either watched the Weirwood's Magic and Lore stream from a couple days ago or listened to the original Weirwood Compendium podcast, as things will make a lot more sense that way. The majority of the series so far is essentially revolved around the connection between Azor High and the Weirwoods. More specifically, we've been looking at the symbolism, which seems to be showing us Azor High breaking into the Weirwood Net through his magical sacrifice of Nissa Nissa, who seems to be some sort of elf woman with a magical connection to the Weirwoods, probably a human child of the forest hybrid. The implication from the first is that Weirwood magic was then involved in the cause of the Long Night, Azor Ahai was trying to harness the weird magic when he broke the moon, and Nissa Nissa, whose death coincides with the moon cracking, was a weirwood woman, chosen for that very reason. I've talked about how nicely this overlays with the Hammer of the Waters legend, one version of which has the blood sacrifice of children of the forest on the Isle of Faces as the thing that caused the Hammer of the Waters to fall. But all the evidence, of course, my opinion, points to the Hammer of the Waters being a mythicized memory of a moon meteor impact, which happened at the time of the Long Night. So then we're left with the idea that ritual sacrifice of children of the forest called down moon meteors. Somehow. Somehow, right? It's a little bit like the underpants gnomes, guys, <laughs> who know that phase one, phase one, collect underpants. Phase three, profits. Hey boss, what's a phase two? <laughs> They don't know what comes in between collecting underpants and collecting profits, right? So in our case, we know that Azor High kills Nissa Nissa in an act of blood magic. And somehow the moon 
gets struck with a comet, cracks off meteors, and causes the long night. And this all seems to coincide. And of course, the Bloodstone Emperor, uh, Amethyst Empress story, which is like a parallel. Again, we have a man murdering a woman. Somehow that causes the darkness and the sun to hide its face. But we don't know what phase two is, right? So today we're going to try to shed light on that by talking about the primary function of the weirwood trees, which is astral projection. The ability of the spirit to leave the body for a period of time and then return to it. Let me just check on something real quick, see how many we got in the house. We've already got 150, so everyone click the like button real quick before you forget, just as we're getting started. And like I said, if you send in a paypal.me uh, donation, you can send in a question with that, and I'll be periodically checking my email box to uh, answer any questions that come that way. So we've, we've touched on this before. Today, we're going to spread our wings and fly if you will. I mean, not literally, this isn't some sort of hypnosis tape or anything. So you're totally safe driving motor vehicles or doing chores or anything else you might be doing while you're listening. The other thing, you know, taking care of small children, I guess in the, in the COVID days, that's what a lot of you might be doing. So the other thing here is, uh, is that we're going to talk about horses, more horses. Now horses were the topic of the last Weirwood Compendium episode, Weirwood Compendium 8, if you recall. We talked about all the amazing green seer symbolism of Danny's silver seahorse, which gallops around the green Dothraki Sea. The idea of boats and ships as winged horses that ride on water. The idea of the stars as fiery steeds of the dead Dothraki warriors. The thing is, the idea of using riding horses as a metaphor for astral travel is really all about Odin, Yggdrasil, and Sleipnir. And in Sleipnir, I should say. And in that last episode, I actually went to great lengths to show all the ways that Martin is using riding horses as a metaphor for green seeing without mentioning any of the Odin stuff, just so we could save that for today. And also so that I could show you the internal A Song of Ice and Fire horse symbolism before revealing the Norse mythology origin for the basic concept. That way you had a chance to see that Martin is definitely, definitely using the silver and gray horse symbol to talk about green seeing and flying and weirwood stuff without ever dipping your toe into Norse mythology parallels, which kind of hog the spotlight once they're introduced. Now that being done, again, in the in Weirwood Compendium 8, we can now mount our astral projection horse and fly amongst the stars, but again, in a safe, non alistair Crowley kind of way. So before we go into horses and astral travel, let's briefly look at the first clues we got that the weirwoods and the green seers were the ones to pull down the moon. It was at the night fort, for example, where Bran saw this. Pale moonlight slanted down through the hole in the dome, painting the branches of the weirwood as they strained up toward the roof. It looked as if the tree was trying to catch the moon and drag it down into the well. Old gods, Bran prayed, if you hear me, don't send a dream tonight, or if you do, make it a good dream. The gods made no answer. So the Weirwood is attacking the moon here, trying to pull it from the very sky, right as Bran is praying to the old gods. Be careful, Bran. Praying to the old gods is how you screw up the moon, apparently. And, oh, yes, this is also at the Night Fort, home of Night's King, right? That's interesting. So earlier in the day, the same Weirwood was actually reaching for the sun as well. And I'll go ahead and say that it was probably with bad intent if it was trying to pull the moon into the well. Now, Bran is on his way to see Blood Raven here, and wouldn't you know it, the weirwood tree at his ancestral home of Raven Tree Hall also has up-jumped ideas about reaching into the heavens. It says, inside the castle walls, however, a bit of the forest still remained. House Blackwood kept the old gods and worshipped as the first men had in the days before the Andals came to Westeros. Some of the trees in their godswood were said to be as old as Raven Tree's square towers, especially the heart tree a weirwood of colossal size, whose upper branches could be seen from leagues away, like bony fingers scratching at the sky. Scratching the sky, reaching for the moon, reaching for the sun, pulling down the moon. These weirwoods really seem to think that they reach all the way to the heavens. But then, of course, Yggdrasil spans all nine realms. So this actually does make a certain amount of sense. 
Another place that we saw trees attacking the moon was when Asha Greyjoy took Deepwood Mott in the Wolf's Wood. And this is from A Dance with Dragons. Tall soldier pines and gnarled old oaks closed in around them. Deepwood was aptly named. The trees were huge and dark, somehow threatening. Their limbs wove through one another and creaked with every breath of wind, and their higher branches scratched at the face of the moon. The sooner we are, sh the sooner we are out of here, the better I will like it, Asha thought. The trees hate us all deep in their wooden hearts. So these aren't weirwoods here, although there are some weirwoods in the wolf's wood. But these trees are symbolizing weirwoods by having wooden hearts and by being described as sentient. They're dark and threatening, and they're trying to scratch at the face of the moon. Or we might say, threatening to make everything dark by pulling down the moon and blotting out the, st blotting out the sun and the stars. Now, those same wolf's wood trees, they do have it in for the sun as well. And this line is from the same chapter. The sun was sinking behind the tall pines of the wolf's wood as Asha climbed the wooden steps to the bedchamber that had once been Galbert Glover's. So this quote here, I mean, it might seem innocuous on its own, the sun sinking beneath the tall pines of the wolf's wood. But these are the same trees that were trying to reach up and scratch the face of the moon. So swallowing the sun could mean something here because to start a night, you do both need to swallow the sun and the moon with darkness. And of course, many of you Norse mythology fans will know that it is the wolves Skoll and Hattie who swallow the sun and moon at the beginning of Ragnarok. And the name of this forest of hostile trees trying to swallow the sun and scratch the moon is the wolf's wood. So Martin is essentially, instead of wolves swallowing the sun, we have trees that are like wolves swallowing the sun. Or in some case, wolf's blooded green seers inside the trees perhaps working to call swallow the sun. So Martin uses the same skull and Hattie ideas at the night fort where Bray and the wolf watch the weirwood tree reach for both the sun and the moon, right? Pull it down in the well. It's very similar to swallowing it. It seems that in a song of ice and fire, the wolves eating the sun and the moon is basically the weirwoods being used to cause the long night. Again, somehow, somehow, there's a way to reach through the weirwoods to the stars, seems like. So the night fort weirwood reaching for the moon is actually mentioned a second time in Bran's chapter after Samwell comes out of the well and tells them all about cold hands. And the quote is full of ominous foreboding about what should happen if the moon is ever blotted from the sky. It says, the wall. The wall is more than just ice and stone, he said. There are spells woven into it, old ones and strong. He cannot pass the wall. It grew very quiet in the castle kitchen then. Bran could hear the soft crackle of the flames, the wind stirring the leaves in the night, the creak of the skinny weirwood reaching for the moon. Beyond the gates the monsters live, and the giants and the ghouls, he remembered old man saying, but they cannot pass so long as the wall stands. So the flow of the writing here is really great, right? So first, there are spells in the wall that stop the monsters and the dead things. And then... Look, it's a weirwood reaching for the moon. And then, ah, we're totally safe from the monsters as long as the wall is standing. But of course, when the wall falls and the monsters and dead things invade, that will be when the new long night falls. And making a new long night seems to involve reaching into the heavens with weirwood magic. So the last quote along these lines comes from Sam's scene where he and Gilly are rescued by cold hands from a pack of whites who have backed them up against a weirwood tree like sacrificial victims. And I should say Gilly and Sam and Gilly's baby. Then this happens. He heard the dark red leaves of the weirwood rustling, whispering to one another in a tongue he did not know. The starlight itself seemed to stir, and all around them the trees groaned and creaked. Sam tarly turned the color of curdled milk, and his eyes went wide as plates. Ravens! They were in the weirwoods, hundreds of them, thousands, perched on the bone-white branches, peering between the leaves. He saw their beaks open as they screamed, saw them spread their black wings. Shrieking, flapping, they descended on the whites in angry clouds. They swarmed around Chet's face and pecked at his blue eyes. They covered the sistermen like flies. They plucked gobbets from inside Hake's shattered head. There were so many when Sam looked up, he could not see the moon. So first the weirwoods rustle, and the starlight stirs. And then we see that that's happening because the ravens are in the branches. So the, 
the weirwood leaves and the starlight sort of merges into the ravens. Then the clouds of ravens blot out the moon. And since we know that ravens are the tools of green seers, kind of seems like what's happened here is the trees have somehow reached into the stars and blotted out the moon with dark clouds. The black ravens also work as meteor symbols, of course, since meteor symbols are always black, since the ravens descend from the sky and the stars here and attack in a swarm, and then they blot out the sky with their spreading black wings. This reminds us of Drogon, of course, the black dragon who is <laughs> has a habit of spreading his wings and blotting out the sky and the sun and all kinds of things. Thus the green seers are implied as calling down the swarm of black meteors, just as they're implied as attacking the moon and sun and all these other scenes. And of course, just as the green seers called down the hammer of the waters, which was really a moon meteor. And yes, corn, corn, corn king, John Snow, corn. Yep, you guys know what's up. You got underpants, gnomes, and raven voice so far today. So feel free to send me a super chat. Ha <laughs> ha, yes, there you go. Oh, I've got two PayPals, thank you. 1420, nice, thanks. Thanks, Matt. I've watched and listened on way too many hours of your content to only give 420. Thanks, buddy. Oh, look at, it's an emoji storm. Eclipse, meteor, fire, trees, smoke. It's like a corn king and, oh, <laughs> some scales and a duck. <laughs> How do you know she's a duck? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't even, I can usually do the whole routine, but uh, I'll have to leave that alone. I want to, I want to stay in the script now, but thank you very much. And then, of course, we've got uh, another one from Maureen. Thank you, Maureen. Love listening to you and Quinn while sewing. Hundreds of masks for my coworkers in the hospital. Oh, my goodness, Maureen. Salt of the earth, bless your heart. Stay safe. And thank you. That's what I'll say to you. Go back up the screen here. Oh, I've got super chats coming in now. Thanks, guys. Tiny bit of prodding. Look at that. No question, just showing my support. Thanks, Harvard or Havard. Uh, blessings from Norway, the land of Norse myths. Yeah, I bet you're liking today's episode. Huh? And if I get anything wrong, please, uh, you know, leave a comment. Let me know. I'm not a Norse myth expert. I mostly know about Yggdrasil and Odin stuff and a few smattering of other things. So definitely not perfect. Does she float? Yes. Thanks, Carl. Underpants gnomes. There we go. So, yeah, hit the like button, all that stuff. Hit the subscribe button if you're watching. Please, please. And thank you. So now, recalling that sacrifice of either humans or children of the forest was required to drop the hammer of the waters, according to legend. Take note of the child sacrifice theme in both the Bran Nightfort scene, where Bran is being given to the old gods and Gilly's babe saved from the cold gods, and also the scene with Gilly and Sam rescued by cold hands from the whites, who were coming for Gilly's baby as they were backed up against the weirwood tree, like, like sacrificial victims. And then in the Wayward Bride chapter, where Asha sees the wolf's wood attacking the moon, Asha herself is the sacrifice, as she ends the chapter getting knocked out cold while backed up against a tree, and her foot was even like tangled in the roots there. There's tons of green seer language. And again, she's backed up against a tree, just like Sam and Gilly were. And the title of the chapter, Wayward Bride, actually seems like wordplay reference to the idea of a weirwood bride, who is of course Nissa Nissa. Oh yes, and one other thing, the man striking the final blow is dressed up like a tree. <laughs> so yes, the weirwood trees seem to have a way to inflict harm upon the moon, given the blood sacrifice of the right people, perhaps. Taco guy piping in, thank you. I still think the ice will melt from a battle between fire and ice. One evidence is that if the polar ice melts, the water will return to the Dothraki Sea, restoring the Silver Sea. I mean, I definitely think um, we're going to get a canceling out of opposites. I agree with that. How much of the frozen lands will melt? We'll have to see. I, I do think that there's foreshadowing that there'll be, uh, if the wall melts, it potentially will create a flood. Remember, if a meteor comes anywhere near the wall, it's actually going to vaporize the wall. It's not going to knock it down. Don't think of like a stone being thrown against a wall and knocking it down. When a meteor or a comet uh, impacts against the earth, it pushes a wave of superheated air over a thousand degrees hot in front of it. That's why the Tunguska event looked like it did. It looked like a bomb blast. It was literally like burnt air and a, and a concussive sound wave that just vaporizes stuff. And so um, 
if it hits anywhere in the north or near the wall, it's basically going to vaporize the wall, turn into steam and water, and you would you would then get floods. And there's a lot of foreshadowing of floods. Um, there's a cool scene where Stannis and John are are arguing over the map of the north. Uh, Stannis lays his Lightbringer sword down along the wall, which could be Comet hitting the wall, foreshadowing. And then the melting wax from the candles runs out uh, from the Bay of Seals, quote, like a melting glacier. So <laughs> you've kind of got all the pieces there, you know. And also we've talked about the Bifrost Bridge being an analog for the wall. And of course, and during Ragnarok, Suter, a fire giant, uses a burning red sword to break the Bifrost Bridge. And then we have Stannis and John, both Azor High Parallels. They've got Lightbringer laid across the wall, and then you have glacier melting things happening. So, yeah, exactly. That's, I definitely think we could get some floods in the north from the wall. So thanks for the super chat. So like I was saying, Wayward Bride, Weirward, Weirward Bride, um, the guy that struck Asha was a tree. So we've just got a ton of trees attacking the moon symbolism. That kind of sets the stage for this whole rest of this episode. But now let's get on to astral projection proper. Flying, folks, it's presented to us as the expected culmination of Bran's arc. His coma dream is all about learning to fly, which is equated with harnessing his budding green seer powers and opening his third eye. When Bran finally meets the wizard and asks if he's going to heal his leg so he can walk again, Blood Raven answers, no, but you will fly. It's the end of the chapter. Everyone remembers that line. Bran won't be able to walk and ride like a knight, but as a green seer, he will fly through the cosmos. Bran seems to have caught a glimpse of this power during his coma dream, where he was first falling and then flying high above the earth itself. And we'll take a closer look at that dream in the next episode. So that's actually a misconception that green seers can only see through the eyes of the weirwoods. As Lord Bloodraven tells us, this is a key point. Nor will your sight be limited to your gods would. The singers carved eyes into their heart trees to awaken them. And those are the first eyes a new green seer learns to use. But in time, you will see well beyond the trees themselves. So what Bloodraven is talking about here is astral projection. The ability to, again, cast your spirit out of your body and travel. Skin changing itself is a kind of astral travel. It's just limited to the perceptions of the person and the animal familiar. But it seems that a green seer can do something much more powerful, having the ability to cast his awareness across time and space. And this could certainly be thought of as flying. It does seem to be a part of what Blood Raven is talking about when he promises that Bran will fly. This is kind of an underappreciated detail. The green seers can actually see anything anywhere, anytime, not just the things that happen in front of heart trees, although those two seem to be important. <clears throat> and let's see here, we've got Moffles. Thank you, Moffles. There's geological evidence of fires starting in Maine from the meteor that killed the dinosaurs, the Yucatan event. A geologist listener. That's cool, yeah, that, I mean, definitely, that's the cool thing about meteors is they basically can cause all kinds of fallout apocalypses forest fires, floods, even earthquakes, and they can set off volcanoes. So if Martin brings meteors down, he can play with lots and lots of apocalyptic disasters. It could be, uh, could be a lot of fireworks at the end of Winds of Winter, for sure. So oh, I think there's one more, too. Make sure. Oh, see, I got Taco Guy and Moffles. Okay, I'm good. So as we know, Odin can do something like this by riding his gallows tree horse, known as Yggdrasil, through the cosmos. Um, I always forget how that pronounced it. Yeah, I want to say Yggdrasil, but that's wrong. It is actually Yggdrasil. So I'll, I'll go ahead with that. The emphasis is supposed to be on Ig. So the most common translation of Yggdrasil is Odin's horse, because Ig is a name for Odin, and Drasil, or Drasil, I guess, means horse. And you'll remember that the gallows tree was known as the horse of the hanged because the hanged people ride the gallows. And Odin was hanged upon Yggdrasil to gain the power of the runes, thus making it both his tree and his horse. However, there's also a hint about spirit walking in the etymology of Yggdrasil as well. Uh, Drasil, or Drasil, I guess, in addition to meaning horse, can also mean walk, 
or to pioneer. Accordingly, Yggdrasil can be translated as Odin Walker, as in spirit walking, which is the term often used for shamanic astral projection. The mythical world tree concept is usually seen as a kind of Jacob's ladder, a stairway to heaven, if you will. And she's by, oh, no stairway. No, no stairway, sir. I used to work at Guitar Center too. We used to make that joke all the time and people would play stairway. But actually not stairway, it was the, the song that people played more was like, uh, it was like Ozzy. It was always like a uh, crazy train. If I had a nickel for every time I heard someone play that in Guitar Center. Anyways, where was I? Uh, Jacob's Ladder, Stairway to Heaven. You remember the fiery ladder in Karth, right? The fire mage climbed the ladder and it puffed into silver smoke. He was climbing towards the latticework ceiling, which implies the latticework of space. So it's very much, again, the world tree is a way to traverse the realms. And that's what Odin does. He... Yggdrasil is, you know, the way that he gets to the nine realms of the cosmos. You can see Yggdrasil and mythical world trees like it basically as the skeleton of the universe. In Norse mythology, there's nine realms, and they're all connected to the tree. And uh, so essentially, Yggdrasil is also a vehicle which enables spirit walking, just like the weirwood trees. <clears throat> and let's see here. Let me get uh, this, this Mr. Wood. Hi, hey, good name. White book entry for Dunk. Sir Duncan the Tall <laughs> has the third biggest member in Westeros, surpassed only by Sir Podrick Longspear and the Queen Slayer. Who's the Queen Slayer? I hope you're not talking about John. He's not going to do that in the books. Um, but I probably can't get into a debate about the size of Dunk's uh, uh, stallion. But I mean, the guy is seven feet tall. It does seem to be, seems like a ladies' man. What, why are you doing this to me, Mr. Wood? Mr. Wood. <sighs> Terrible. I love you. Don't stop. All right. Hm. Don't stop. Oh, right on Ned's lawn. Don't stop the music. All right. So Odin has another horse, though. It's not just Yggdrasil as a spirit walking horse. There's one that's more strictly used for astral projection. And this is where the shit's going to get a little weird. That other horse is the eight-legged gray steed the best of horses, called Sleipnir. And instead of a tree that is called a horse, Sleipnir is actually depicted as a horse, but he too is not really a horse. And just to put it simply, Sleipnir is a powerful vehicle for astral projection. And here I will quote from Norse Mythology for Smart People at norsemythology.org. It says, the eight-legged horse as a means of transportation used by shamans in their ecstatic travels throughout the cosmos is a motif that can be found in a staggering number of indigenous traditions from all over the world. Sleipnir is the shamanic horse par excellence, just as Odin is the shamanic god par excellence. So Odin rides Sleipnir, Sleipnir sorry, to move between the nine worlds of the Norse cosmos, which are loosely divided between the three levels of Yggdrasil, as I just mentioned. Which even, and Sleipnir even allows him to ride into the heavens or the pit of hell and back out again. So it's an astral projection horse. I don't, I don't know what else to call it. Um, it's, I almost called this episode astral projection horse, but the text doesn't really line up very well. So in any case, you, you got this. Um, shamanic thunder horse. I know this sounds strange, guys, but th here's how this makes sense. So the drums used in shamanic rituals are the key. They're a central tool that the shaman uses to alter his consciousness, to pry open his third eye. This hypnotizing beat is likened to the thunder of horses' hooves. And thus we get the idea of a thunderous horse, which conveys the rider through time and space. The astral projection horse that is not really a horse. A horse is a horse, a horse, of course, unless, of course, the name of that horse is the famous Mr. Sleipnir. But jokes aside, I do recommend Mercia Eliade's authoritative, though controversial, work titled Shamanism for further reading about this concept. A couple of super chats coming in. Hopefully they'll not be quite so perverted and vile as Mr. Woods. I'm just I'm just playing with you. I'm just playing. Um, we've got oh Taco Guy's back. Part two. Realizing she can't beat prophecy, she will kill intentionally herself to save the second child because Cersei's uh, who are we talking about here? Oh, I guess Cersei. Um Oh right. So so Cersei's trying to avoid her three kids getting killed, right? Um so you're suggesting that she'll kill herself to save 
I guess it would be uh, Marcella or Tommen. Because Cersei dies before the second birth of the child can be born. This will allow some redemption for Cersei. I don't think Cersei is going to get any redemption. That much I can say. I'm interested in this idea if you can flesh it out to me on Twitter or something. But uh, I think the prophecy will come true. I think all of Cersei's uh, kids are going to be... Uh... Oh, I missed the first... Okay, let me try reading this again. See if I missed something. Part one says, I have a theory of Cersei's death in the book. She will be pregnant like the show. Oh, I see. But she will give birth to twins, one girl and one boy. But the girl will be stillborn. Oh, it's a very detailed theory. And then he says... Part two, realizing she can't beat prophecy, she will kill intentionally herself to save the second child. Oh, I see. Okay, so after Tom and, and Marcella have died, you think this 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 arc could come about. Okay, that's interesting. I don't know if there is foreshadowing for Cersei getting pregnant. I know that happened in the show where they played with it and sort of walked away from it. It's unclear. Um, but uh, yeah, interesting idea. Thank you very much for the super chat and the support. And of course, at the dragon, LML is how you find me on Twitter. If you want to discuss Song of Ice and Fire ideas, and the other good way to do it is to comment in the video below. And uh, and I, I usually respond to comments in the first couple days after the video comes out. So. Would it be possible for Bran to learn crazy astral projection type magic to undo the effects that the moon meteor had on the planets? I.D. the seasons going back to normal and balance being restored. No, uh, that's not crazy at all. I mean, I guess I would say, yes, it is possible. Absolutely. Um, that is kind of where this going. Um, Bran and Danny both have symbolism that implies they might need to fly or do something in order to help save the world. And that we'll get to in Weirwood Compendium 10, essentially. Ooh, Matt, yes. Eight-legged Sleipnir would look like an ice spider. Yeah, totally, totally. So I've talked about my ice spider theory a couple times now. When, when George says that the others ride the winds of winter and they ride ice spiders. Um, I think that an ice spider is a metaphor for a frozen weirwood tree because when trees are weighed down with ice and snow, the branches sort of curl down and touch the ground and it would basically look like a hunched over spider. And if you see the frozen weirwood tree that Bran sees in the heart of winter in the TV show, it looks like a spider. Um, and so the idea of the others riding the ice winds and the ice spiders essentially says that they're riding weirwood trees and that makes a lot of sense because the others seem to come from the weirwood trees. Then you have the whole Sleipnir angle. Of course, Sleipnir being an astral projection horse ties into weirwood symbolism. And so now we have, you know, another way in which the weirwood is the ice spider because Sleipnir is an eight legged horse. Very good. Thank you, Matt. You're on it. So here's a little bit more about the eight legged horse idea. So the eight legs of Sleipnir are thought to represent both the unusual gait of Icelandic horses, which is something called flying pace, which is a quote, two beat lateral gait used for racing, <clears throat> for you two like horseback riding fans out there watching right now. Um, and it makes them look as though they have eight legs. So it's just a particular way, it's because of the pace, it looks like they have eight legs. So there's another explanation though, which picks our interest. And according to some, although there's some dispute about this, this is a reference to the eight legs of the four pallbearers that carry a coffin, with the coffin being Odin's true means of astral projection, because he always dies in order to gain magic, such as when he hangs on Yggdrasil. And um, the Yggdrasil is, uh, has other coffin symbols as well. And if you think at the end of Ragnarok, the last humans hide inside a tree and then come back out of the tree. Um, the weirwids are like coffins. So there's there's so a lot of coffin weirwood tree ideas. Odin is the Lord of the Gallows and the Lord of the Dead, something like Hades. So it kind of makes sense to see the coffin as his vehicle of transformation. Now, the Vikings don't use coffins, so this idea is disputed. However, as I mentioned before, the shamanic horse idea is actually very old and spread all throughout Europe in places where coffins are used. So probably an older association. Now, whether or not this was intended by the original authors of Norse myth is almost beside the point, because what we're actually doing here is trying to look for things that George Martin might be drawing inspiration from. And as a student of Norse mythology in college, Martin would, of course, be familiar with all of this stuff and the debate around it and everything. And it sure seems like he's using this idea. Like I said, the weirwoods are sacred trees 
which are vehicles for astral projection, but also coffins for green seers. And you know, all the all the green seers and maybe even all the nature, like children of the forest, are basically that's their afterlife. So you can see how nicely they tie into several layers of Odin myth. Um, now we're about to break down three scenes with pounding drums and weirwood symbolism that demonstrate the concept of the shamanic horse very well. But we already saw one of these at the Battle of the Blackwater in the last Weirwood Compendium episode. This one's especially tasty because it brings in the symbol of the winged seahorse. So I'll read part of it again for you, even though we used it in the last episode, like two years ago. <laughs> A hundred blades dipped into the water as the oarmaster's drum began to boom. The sound was like the beating of a great slow heart, and the oars moved at every stroke, a hundred men pulling as one. Wooden wings had sprouted from Wraith and Lady Maria as well. Now, we mentioned this quote last time to point out that the wooden sea dragons and seahorse ships sprouting wings are doing this in time with a great wooden heartbeat. So, of course, sea dragons refer to the Grey King's you know, Sea Dragon Hall, which is actually a weirwood boat. And that gives you the idea of using a ship to sail the Sea of Time, the weirwood as a wooden ship, a boat that sails the River of Time and the Green Sea and all that. And of course, uh, the Valerians own the seahorse ships. We've got all the seahorse symbolism from the last episode. And then they're sprouting wooden wings, so we know that they're flying on the sea and they're doing it in time again with a great wooden heartbeat, which makes you think of heart trees. So, it's all right there with seahorse ships, sea dragon ships. They're both well established as weirwood symbols and they sprout wooden wings shortly before burning with green fire, which is another, another green fire of the God symbol. So we know that we're talking about green seeing here in this whole battle. The wooden heartbeat that makes all the oars pull as one seems like a good representation of the hive mind behind the heart trees. And it comes guys from a great booming drum the heartbeat of the weirwoods is a booming drum that's a perfect representation of the hoofbeat of the shamanic horse being a drum so now these drum beat um that these drum beats are also hoofbeats is spelled out by the seahorse symbolism because of course seahorses have hooves we've got pride of driftmark and a seahorse here in the fleet and we know that all of Danny's silver seahorse symbolism bounces off of the Valerian ships. Um, Valerian ships are also painted silver, an approximate match for Sleipnir's gray. And you recall that Danny's horse has both silver and gray. The wooden seahorse ships sprouting wooden wings in the scene are a direct call out to Danny speaking to Drogo of, quote, wooden horses with a hundred legs that fly across the sea on wings full of wind. So, of course, these boats can have hoofbeats. The point I really want to hammer home is that George is specifically associating all these green seer metaphors with flying by having the ships sprout wings, winged ships, winged horses, winged wooden horses as names for ships. It's all talking about green seeing as flying and the weirwood as being a wooden vessel, a horse or a ship that the green seer uses to fly via astral projection with drumming at the heart of it. I see a couple of super chats coming in. Thank you. You guys are showing lots of love today. Appreciate that. Part three from Taco Guy going on the Cersei thing. So the little brother that kills her is the twin because she sacrifices herself for, oh, I see. Or she asked Jamie to kill her. So the baby lives. So the Valonqar prophecy, the board Valonqar means little brother. So it's either Jamie or Tyrion, most people think. So this Taco Guy theory is saying that her she'll have twins, one of them dead, one of them lives, and if she sacrifices herself to save the baby, then in a way, that younger brother would be killing her. That's very speculative, but very interesting. And if it happens, we'll know that we heard it from Taco Guy. Like I said, if you've got a write-up on that, man, feel free to share it with me on Twitter. <clears throat> uh, I see a question about the idea of Odin dying at the hands of a wolf from Sean O'Donnell. Uh, yeah, perhaps, well, this, that could be talking about Bran taking over for Bloodraven, right? Because Bloodraven is the real strong Odin parallel. And so if Bloodraven, you know, dies in order to give way to Bran, that, that could be an echo there. Um, and yeah, John's death, he goes into the wolf as well. We'll have to see how that shakes out. 
And again, all these trees swallowing the sun and moon are wolf trees, like the wolf's wood. So, okay, so if Aegon is a black fire, I would love him uh, and think he will be a hero. Also, I would, it would be not cool to see the Emperor of the Dawn restored as magic comes back. No, it isn't going to be cool. Euron is trying to be the new god emperor in the echo, in the sort of legacy of the great empire of the dawn. And I'm going to talk about that exact topic in my new Euron video coming out in like a week, J Lord. So thank you. And check that out if you want more talk of that. And it is going to suck to the extent that it happens. Um, I also think that Fagon sucks though, too. I think he is a black fire, but I think he sucks. Pick up my pieces, dwarf. I'm not going to have no chessboard flipper for my king or hero, but he's going to die anyways. He's the cloth dragon on poles. He's a lie that has to be slain. So he may have a moment of valiance. He may get a tumble in the sack with Ariane Martel, but that's it. He's going to go out after that, in my opinion. Um, Enforcer Max, the cool He-Man icon. Do you see a link between Boash, the blind god, and the children of the forest? The eunuch priests try to open their third eye just like Bran. Yeah, I mean, it's at least a thematic parallel, and it's a real-world concept, too. I mean, this whole Odinic concept... It's not just confined to Norse mythology. I mean, the whole idea of a monk or an aesthetic going into like living a hermit that lives in a hut or in isolation deprives themselves of all pleasures in order to pursue like meditative, you know, activities and enlightenment. It's the same idea. You're just you're sacrificing the physical self to elevate the higher self. That's the whole principle being spelled out here. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of connections between Ragnarok and the Long Night. I see someone asking about that. I'm we're not even going to begin to get into all the parallels, but there is a ton, and other people have done a lot of it on that too. My name is Fagon. Wait, no, my name is Fagon. There it is. All right, cool. So one of the very best scenes, guys, where Martin lays the shamanic drumming symbolism over the use of the weirwood tree comes from a Theon chapter of A Dance with Dragons. This happens as he wanders into the godswood at Winterfell at the hour of the wolf. And in the heart of the wood, the weirwood waited with its knowing red eyes. Theon stopped by the edge of the pool and bowed his head before its carved red face. Even here, he could hear the drumming. Boom, doom, boom, doom, boom, doom, boom, doom. Like distant thunder, the sound seemed to come from everywhere at once. The night was windless the snow drifting straight down out of a cold black sky, yet the leaves of the heart tree were rustling his name. Theon! Oh, no. <laughs> that was my raven voice. The leaves don't have raven voice. It would be like, Theon. They seem to whisper, Theon. All right, there you go. The old gods, he thought. They know me. They know my name. That was funny. <laughs> raven voice came out accidentally. <laughs> oh, anyways. So Theon pleads with the weirwood tree, and then it says, A leaf drifted down from above, brushed his brow, and landed in the pool. It floated on the water, red, five-fingered, like a bloody hand. Bran, the tree murmured. They know. The gods know. They saw what I did. And for one strange moment, it seemed as if Bran's face, as if it were Bran's face carved into the pale trunk of the weirwood, staring down at him with eyes red and wise and sad. So this is cool. I love how George uses the bloody red hand symbolism of the weirwood leaves to point out Theon as being red handed and guilty. It's very funny. But more important is the apparent fact that Bran is using the weirwoods to speak to Theon here. Bran is at this very moment mounting the astral projection horse of the weirwoods to communicate with and see Theon. We hear thunder and it's literally the thunder of drums booming outside Winterfell. And the cool thing is it seems to come from everywhere at once, which sort of dislocates it from physical space and makes it omnipresent. In another line from this chapter, it says, the drumming seemed to be coming from the wolf's wood beyond the hunter's gate, which implies the drumming as coming from the wood itself. And of course, the wolf's wood is the one, you know, pulling down the moon and attacking the moon and all that stuff. So to put it simply, the thunderous drumming leads directly into Bran speaking through the rustling weirwood leaves. And this is a major clue to associate the thunder drums with using the weirwood. 
is also a nice tie to the Grey King myth of the thunderbolt setting the tree ablaze, as basically all the elements of the myth are present. The burning trees represented by the weirwood. There's thunder coming from the wood and the air itself. So there's your storm god's thunderbolt. And Bran is associating the fire of the... Um, and then uh, Bran is associating the fire of the god. I'm sorry, associating. Bran is accessing the fire of the gods to reach Theon. Thank you. There you go. Now, if you've ever been Moore's Crow Food Umber fans who've been waiting, here's your moment. So the person beating the drums and blowing the horns in the woods is none other than Moore's Crow Food Umber and his crew of green boys. Moore's green boys are mentioned three times, just to make sure we notice. And of course, green boys make us think of children of the forest who take care of the green wood. The children play a facilitator role for the green seer, just as the drummers do for a shaman entering a trance. The children both do things to, or both of them do things to aid the magician's entrance into the astral plane, be that serving up weirwood paste, paste of weirwood seeds, and strange advice, <laughs> or playing the drums for hours on end. So here we have green boys playing drums, blowing horns, and then far away in a cave, little green children are helping Bran use the weirwood trees to fly. So all of this makes sense. It's a perfect parallel. As for Moores himself, well, we've got to talk about him. He's introduced to us in A Clash of Kings with the Odin makeover and more horn blowing. The blast of horns woke him. <laughs> Bran pushed himself onto his side, grateful for the reprieve. He heard horses and boisterous shouting. More guests have come and half drunk by the noise of them. Grasping his bars, he pulled himself from the bed and over to the window seat. On their banner was a giant in shattered chains that told him these were the Umber Men, down from the Northlands beyond the last river. Mm. Sorry, guys, I just trimmed my mustache, and it's like... It keeps itching me right in the middle there. Sorry. I don't have COVID. I'm, I'm cool. My hands are clean. I don't hardly go anywhere. I don't ever leave the house. I'm a YouTuber. I'm very safe. In any case, uh, I do have an itchy mustache, though. Okay, so... The next day, two of them came together to audience. The great John's uncles, blustery men, I'm sorry. The next day, two of them came together to audience. The great John's uncles, blustery men in the winter of their days with beards as white as the bearskin cloaks they wore. A crow had once taken moors for dead and pecked out his eye. So he wore a chunk of dragon glass in its stead. As old man told the tale, he'd grabbed the crow in his fist and bitten its head off. So they named him crow food. That's right. The man blowing horns outside Winterfell, beating drums to make thunder seem to come from the black air of the godswood as Bran accesses the weirwood net, is a one-eyed man associated with dragonglass and waking giants in the earth. That's the umber sigil, the giant uh, breaking out of the chains, the waking giant. So the crow pecked out his eye, which calls out to the tale of the bad little boy who climbed too high and was struck down by lightning, if you remember. The crow's eating out his eyes afterwards. And of course... It just generally is the idea of Odin losing one of his eyes. Now, the bad little boy story is meant as a companion to Bran's own climb and fall and essentially combines the lightning striking the tower motif, or the tree, that is, with the Odin-esque idea of losing one eye to open your third eye. This gives Moors what you might call redundant layers of Odin symbolism, which nicely parallel that of Bran and Bloodraven. Indeed, Moore's Crowfoot is almost like an avatar of Bloodraven, especially with that dragon glass eye. Think about it. A dragon glass eye implies the concept of seeing through a glass candle, which is something that Valerian sorcerers do. And combined with all Moore's green seer symbolism, kind of gives you that dragons and green seeing combination that is Bloodraven. And of course, Bloodraven's eye is red like an ember. So, dragon glass. Red Ember, these are both fiery dragon things, right? Looks like I got another Super Che, Super Chisel. Super Chisel, I'm going to start saying that. I like that. Matt Clayton, do you think the Weirwood has a consciousness of its own? And if so, what does it want? What a tree wants, what a tree needs. Whatever makes it happy is whatever bleeds. Oh, how? So, is it a hive mind or a net of power which can be accessed? So, I have a controversial opinion about this, which is that there is no weirwood consciousness left in the trees. That's inside the others now. Um, 
or if there is something left, it's like a residual thing. The trees are like zombies. They are white trees, W-I-G-H-T, white trees, in that their consciousness has been hollowed out and other consciousness are living inside and making them move, right? It's the green seers who are invading the bodies of the trees and animating them. And the trees look like zombies. They're like undead. They're like bleeding and they're carved up and they're like, give me brains and blood. So they eat people, you know what I mean? So they're, they're zombie trees. That implies there's, there's the, the tree spirits aren't in there. And of course we have all the symbolism implying that the others, some part of the others are like evicted tree spirits. They're angry she, right? And so I think this is how we fix this great, so the great part of the great sin of Azor High invading the Weirwood Net is that humans weren't supposed to go in there, only like children of the forest and stuff. So once Azor High invades, this kicks out the natural tree spirit. They're evicted. They become pissed off others, White Walkers, in part anyways. And so what we have to do to fix everything is we got to take all that green seer hive mind, which is the combination of all the green seers that have been in there, and put it in Bran's head and maybe get the other spirits their home back. That's kind of my working headcanon, so. Um, oh, look at that. It is 420, uh, uh, where is it? Like just off the Pacific coast somewhere. Yes, um, somewhere, not quite in Hawaii. Hawaii is like maybe like three hours off or something, um, but somewhere, um, but, I'll give a shout out to the first person who can tell me what country it is 420 in right now. How about that? Who can do it? What a tree wants, what a tree needs, whatever makes it happy is whatever bleeds. I'm going to write the rest of that one. That's good. Uh, oh, British Columbia, Canada. Nice. That comes from Mikey Krizzles. Somebody said Narnia. <laughs> That's cool. I will also accept Narnia. <laughs> One second. I need a new lighter, or at least need to refill this. Oh, sorry. Praise Garth. Praise Garth. There we go. It's always 420 in the Shire. Totally. Nice. Also acceptable. So we're talking about Moore's Crow Food. And one-eyed Odin figures. <coughs> that was a typo. Oh, you want another Pearl Emperor, not a Bloodstone one. Okay, I got you. Well, Euron is not going to be cool. He's going to be another Bloodstone Emperor. Um, perhaps there'll be some... I haven't thought about parallels between like the last hero, heroic archetype, and any of the great Empire of the Dawn figures. But the Starks do have a lot of pearl symbolism. The direwolf is pearl sometimes. Pearl's a moon symbol. The Starks have moon symbolism. Blast Hero has moon symbolism, actually. So, yeah, I'll go with that. Oh, awesome. I just randomly clicked on this. It's... I'm so glad chat is cool. Makes me feel better about my life. Oh, well, I don't even know what that's referring to. Maybe I shouldn't uh, inquire. Who knows? Could be like, our chat is cool, though. I'll say that. Uh, all right. Uh, where were we? So think about this. We're talking about the one-eyed Odin archetype. Uh, people with one blue eye seem like Knight's King figures, right? Euron, Amund One-Eye, Waymar Royce, and uh, possibly one or two others. Blood Raven, meanwhile... He works against the others, and he has the blood of the dragon, and he's got one red eye. So if we could describe Blood Raven's archetype, you might call it the three-eyed crow, or you might call it the fiery green seer. And we can say that the three-eyed crow is aligned with the Night's Watch and stands directly against the Night's King and the others, to the extent that we've been speaking of a frozen half of the green sea inhabited by the others and a hot half of the underworld portion of the Weirwood Net which is inhabited by the green seers, the three-eyed crow is kind of like the king of the living half of the weirwood net, the green half. 
as opposed to the Knights King or great other figure, if such a being actually exists. And, and I do think, ugh, man, something does exist along those lines. So accordingly, uh, we've looked at brand symbolism and it's all fiery, right? Remember a burning Brandon, Weirwood Compendium 2, um, as we've seen. So, you know, Brand's name means both Raven and burning Brand. And he's going to take Blood Raven's pray, uh, place. So we have a dragon green seer, and then we have a green seer who's like a burning brand, uh, like the fire of the gods. So, of course, I've joked that, uh, you know, he, he might be named Burn Raven to Brand's Blood Raven. That way they can keep all the monogrammed bath towels the same. Yada, yada, yada. Beric is the same type of person, right? He's got one red eye. He's got a ton of green seer symbolism that mirrors Blood Raven, but he's also got the Azor High Reborn resurrected fire stuff going on. So these type of figures always need... So uh, let me just to elaborate. Beric, you know, like I said, the three-eyed raven is like the king of the weirwood net, the warm side. That's what that's what Beric is showing us. He's showing us a, a version of Azor High, who's like a fiery green seer. And he's very much a hero, right? Beric is totally heroic. He's protecting the common folk of the land against the ravening wolves of Tywin's dogs. So that's a very last hero type function. So... And um, you think about John as a potential last hero. He's going to be a dragon and kind of a weirwood warrior. His wolf looks like a weirwood. John might come out with white hair and red eyes and looking kind of like Beric. So that's all of an archetype, basically. That's kind of what I'm saying. There's there's two competing figures, Green Seer King, Three-Eyed Crow, and Knight's King. And they're like two opposite versions of what can happen when Azor High taps into the weirwood nest. Some Azor High figures end up like a Knight's King after resurrection. And some end up like a Barrack or Blood Raven or Moore's Crow Food. Moore's actually could be a hint about John. Like I was saying, if John comes back to life with snow white hair, he'll look like Moore's with his snow white hair. And Moore's Crow Food has a dragon glass eye. John's eyes are a gray so dark they seemed almost black. And that's the exact same language that describes Valerian Steel. Most Valyrian steel was a gray so dark it looked almost black. So John has Valyrian steel eyes instead of dragon glass eyes. Very, very similar, right? You might even say black ice eyes. Which, shout out to John Ice Eyes, one of my best longtime patrons. Um, oh, I see a good question from Mad Otters here. Do you think Theon will become one of John's 12 companions in the whole Last Hero math? Asa, Asa, Asha suggests, oh man, that's a tongue twister. I should make one with those two words. To Stannis in Winds of Winter to kill him under a weirwood. I like that idea very much. Um, I totally think that would be a cool way to redeem people like Theon or Jamie is to have them join John's Last Hero Dirty Dozen. I'm pulling for that. I'm afraid that the Last Hero Dirty Dozen would be too fan servicey uh, for me personally, but it would be very cool, so we'll see. Alisa, what are you trying to say? Bran Raven is Twitter. He's Varys' little bird. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I didn't get the joke. I think I missed the joke. But if you think about it, um, Bran being like the ravens carry messages, Varys' little bird bring him whispers. Varys is called the spider, and he sits at the center of the web. So that's basically... Ice Spider Sleipnir symbolism. We've we've already figured out that Varys has Green Seer symbolism simply because he gets all the information from the little birds and he lives in the underworld and he sort of wears different disguises like a skin changer. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, and then uh, he also, he's all his children, right? His little children are the ones that serve him and carry his messages also. Those are actually his birds or his children. So uh, there you go. There's a lot of stuff. So the fact that he's the spider could indicate that the weirwood net is like a web, that the whole idea of Sleipnir being an eight-legged horse, George is connecting to spiders, potentially. Very cool. So getting back to Morris Crow food uh, and these archetypes. Like I said, John's got Valerian steel eyes instead of dragon glass eye, but if he comes out with the white hair, that would be really cool. Of course, he'd look like then Elric of Melnibene. All of which just to say, Moore's crow food of the dragonglass eye is clearly aligned symbolically with Bran and Blood Raven, 
and our other fiery green seers, three-eyed crow type figures. So you can see the whole picture now. Moore's crow food, a blood raven bear type, leads green boys, who symbolize children of the forest, and then they are credited with waking sleepers with horns and beating the drums, which aid Brand, uh, Bran to mount his weirwood tree stallion. Pretty cool, right? A couple of last notes on the umbers, which pertain to Odin, that I have yet to mention. This bit from A Clash of Kings, where Bran, oh, I'm sorry, let me just, uh, Uh, okay, so let's see here. Um, all right, a couple of last notes on the umbers, which pertain to Odin that I've yet to mention. This bit from A Clash of Kings, where Bran is woken by a horn blast, also introduces the umbers as coming down from beyond the last river. That's a good euphemism for coming back from death. Odin, of course, is a psychopomp figure who def defeats death himself. Um, and speaking of horns, Moore's crow food is notoriously drunk. It says, Moore's crow food is a drunken brute, according to La Lady Hornwood. <laughs> and he enters Winterfell half drunk, drinking from horns, of course. Now, Odin is often depicted drinking from a horn while riding Sleipnir, or Sleipnir. He's drinking the mead of poetry, which is, of course, another way to gain magical knowledge. Um, and those, so those boom doom drums that were happening in the godswood that sh give you our, you know, our shamanic horse turn out to be a good thing to key in on if we're looking for shamanic drumming. We find them in two other places, the first of which is the Red Wedding. Yikes, the Red Wedding. That's where Catelyn's, her big weirwood stigmata scene, right? Where she dies and symbolically merges with and becomes the weirwood tree, acquiring bloody tears, bloody red hands, carved face, mouthful of blood, red smile, throat cutting, mimicking the bloody carved smile of the weirwoods and the silence of the weirwoods. And the shamanic boom doom drums are woven all throughout the Red Wedding. They occur no less than four separate times. We're not gonna quote the entire scene, so don't worry about that. But here is the first occurrence, check this out. Then the tabletop that the small John had flung over Rob shifted and her son struggled to his knees. He had an arrow in his side, a second in his leg, a third through his chest. Lord Walder raised a hand and the music stopped all but one drum. Catelyn heard the crash of distant battle and closer the wild howling of a wolf. Gray wind, she remembered too late. Heh, Lord Walder cackled at Rob. The king in the north arises. Seems we killed some of your men, your grace. Oh, but I'll make you an apology. That will mend them all again. Heh. Catelyn grabbed a handful of Jingo Bell Frey's long gray hair and dragged him out of his hiding place. Lord Walder, she shouted, Lord Walder. The drum beat slow and sonorous. Doom, boom, boom. Enough, said Catelyn. Enough, I say. You have rep rep uh, repaid betrayal with betrayal. Let it end. When she pressed her dagger to Jingo Bell's throat, the memory of Bran's sick room came back to her with the feel of steel at her own throat. The drum went boom, doom, boom, doom. Boom, doom. So we're not going to go any farther with that, so don't worry. Catelyn, so she's the weirwood goddess figure, right? And her son, Rob, is like a dying last hero figure. He's sprouting quarrels like a tree sprouting limbs. We've seen that symbolism a couple times. It happened in one of Dunk's dream where he's um, he's uh, running towards, uh, 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 gosh. Oh, man, one of my favorite characters, and I can't remember her name. The girl with red hair that lives at Cold Moat that Dunk's in love with. Oh, gosh, so embarrassing. I just wait five seconds for the chat to catch up and tell me the name of this fair maiden that Dunk falls in love with. She lives at Cold Moat. And Lady Weber, Rohan Weber, thank you. More spider and weirwood symbolism there. What? We'll have to do more of that later. That's another day, another day. And of course, Rohan Weber, Rowan Weber. Rowan is the name of a, another name for a type of ash tree, a mountain ash. It's actually not an ash tree, but it's called mountain ash. So Rowan, we, f we figured out that Rowan tree symbolism is also ash tree symbolism. So red haired ash tree maiden and dunk sprouts quarrels as he's running towards her in a burning wood in a dream. And anyways, getting back to the red wedding here, same idea, Rob sprouting quarrels, 
We have a weirwood goddess right next to him doing the weirwood stigmata. And then we've got the boom doom drums. So um, <laughs> uh, what's cool about also is that when Rob, when Walder offers to apologize and mend Rob's dead men, which seems like this cool little insult, that's actually really cool symbolism because Rob's dead men would be like the last hero's companions. And so what we're offering to do is to resurrect them as green zombies. And they, you know, that's exactly what they should, what should happen. So very cool stuff here um, in the middle of this horrific scene. There's always good symbolism in the worst scenes, it seems like. Um, and then, of course, Catelyn recalls Bran's near sacrifice at the hands of the cat's paw assassin, which is Catelyn's other weirwood stigmata scene where she gets blood in her mouth and bloody hands and she bites the cat's paw's hand. What's Bran doing at that very moment? He's in his coma dream flying. <clears throat> so perfect symbolic overlay between the scenes. Now, um, Last Hero Rob's resurrection is also represented by the very macabre act of mounting Grey Wind's head on Rob's body. Uh, this is very, again, very dark, but it's the image of an undead wolf man. And that's exactly how we should think of the last hero. That's exactly what resurrected John is going to be like when his spirit probably merges with ghost and then gets put back in his body. And the phrase as Lords of the crossing have obvious psychopomp symbolism, they guard the river and the crossing and they're the ones making Wolfman Rob and offering to raise his men from the dead. And then all the while, again, boom, doom, go the shamanic drums. <clears throat> Elisa's all frowny faces. Well, it's okay, Elisa, we're moving on. We're mo I, actually, no, we're not. I'm sorry. Elisa, <laughs> if you got to turn away for three minutes, then uh, then you got to do it. But yeah, one more Red Wedding quote. Sorry, guys. So the other three occurrences of the repeated boom dooming at the Red Wedding come interspersed with the dialogue as Kat offers to trade Aegon Jingle Bell's life for Rob's. Walter says no. Roos kills Rob with a sword through the heart. And Cat gives Jingle Bell the red smile. The last boom doom drums comes right as Cat gives and receives the stigmata, beginning with her cutting the fool's throat. <clears throat> Blood ran hot over her fingers. His little bells were ringing, 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 and the drum went boom doom boom. Finally, someone took the knife away from her. The tears burned like vinegar as they ran down her cheeks. Ten fierce ravens were raking her face with sharp talons and tearing off strips of flesh, leaving deep furrows that ran red with blood. She could taste it on her lips. So these are both ritual sacrifices here. Cat is becoming the weirwood goddess, getting the stigmata. Then a stark King of Winter last hero figure, Rob, is getting the Nissa Nissa-like sword thrust to the heart, and a fool named Aegon is getting sliced across the throat like a weirwood sacrifice. The drums are booming during the entire scene, and this simply adds to the dark blood ritual vibe, certainly. And then, of course, it gives the idea of shamanic drumming, which fits the meaning of all this death symbolism. And this has to do with these Azor High and Nissa Nissa figures basically entering the weirwood net here. Rob and Aegon Jingle Bell are presented as parallel figures at the beginning of the scene. Catelyn regarding the fool's crown that Aegon Jingle Bell wears as a mockery of Rob's crown. And this, this crosses over Rob's last hero symbolism with Aegon and dragon symbolism. Martin is inviting us to consider Rob's foolishness in thinking that he could cheat the Lord of the Crossing, i.e. the Lord of Death. And then he's giving us Rob and Aegon dying together simultaneously. And what's funny is that if you put Rob and Jingle Bell's Aegon's names together, you get Aegon Stark, which might end up being Jon Snow's name by the time it's all said and done. There you go. Hashtag Aegon Stark. That makes sense, of course, because John is the actual green zombie that we will get in the story. And he is both a dragon lord and a last hero and a skin changer and a wolf. So there you have it. Basically, everything about Rob's death has always seemed to foreshadow John. I'm just building on that, on that symbolism. But <clears throat> one second, guys. I've actually got to take a really quick uh, trip to the bathroom. So if you guys will just hang tight for two seconds. This is uh, the marathon live streams.
require a short break sometimes. And I'll grab the super chat when I get back. Again, thanks for bearing with me there. So, uh, oh boy. Demanding OnlyFans, demanding Quinn's puppy. You guys don't own me. I mean, how much would you pay me though? All right, anyways, back to the topic at hand. Oh no, there was a super chat, let's get that. And I need to check my email too for the paypal.me's. Like reward those kind folks. From J Lord again in the books, the Starks are far richer. Forget the leather of the show, they wear a lot of White velvet, gray silk, silver jewelry, and their guards wear silver-plated mail. A lot of pearl symbolism. Oh, okay. I, I follow you. I follow you, J-Lord. Yeah, well, so check out the goblet. Um, there's a goblet at where I think it's – um. Uh, is it is it the chalice that, at Joffrey's wedding that has the sigil of all the great houses and the Starks have a pearl direwolf? I'm not sure. There's – there's definitely more than one pearl direwolf and pearls are moon symbols. So yeah, that all lines up. I'm with you, J Lord. <laughs> John Stark as a pearl emperor or Bran Stark, I guess. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, yeah, J Lord. Thanks man for dropping all the super chats, dude. You rock. Really appreciate that. And uh, that looks like a tweet of mine. Let's see here. There's a discord link. Um, Let's see here, and let me check. Yes, totally, totally things happening. Ben for the 420, thank you, Ben. Is it possible the glass candles from come from impact crater glass, either a moon or land impact? Green glass was found on the moon recently. Wow, that sounds cool and very Lovecraftian. All the best from the dream time realms. Well, I'm a little bit, if we're gonna see moon meteor material anywhere, I'm I'm hoping that it's maybe the secret ingredient in Valerian steel, and that's why they can't make new Valerian steel. The Valerians did have that slave colony on Gagasos, which is right next to the Isle of Toads, where they had a whole bunch of oily black stone. So maybe some of the oily black stone, which might be like burnt meteor stone or something, you know, the impact stuff. But to your to your point, um, dragon glass or obsidian is also created with impact events too. Um, so is that special. Maybe the glass candles aren't just any obsidian. Maybe that's what makes something a glass candle as opposed to just dragon glass. But I don't know. That's pretty cool. Cool speculatory idea. And thank you. And oh, I've got a few here. Uh, Keaton, 666, just wants to support. Thanks. Thank you for the hard work. Really appreciate that. I do work hard. Stephanie Courier. Thanks, Stephanie. Appreciation for the dedication. Woo, yeah. Well, what's coming up is two fatty Euron episodes. Oh, Ali, you don't you don't have to send. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. You don't have to send me anything, but I appreciate that. Your modding is, is a huge contribution as it is. And I should Ali, drop your uh, uh, your YouTube channel, please. Um, Elisa Patience has a couple of great videos on her YouTube channel. She's just getting started. And I know that I, I think she doesn't have, she's making her videos on a phone because she doesn't have the right computer equipment yet. So support that YouTube channel. Maybe we can get her some equipment, but she's making great videos even on her phone. And 
they are really cool uh, as far as a symbolic and folklore parallels. Um, it dovetails right into a lot of our stuff that we've been looking at with Daenerys. So highly recommend that. Elisa or another mod, please drop the YouTube channel link for your channel in the chat. So Garrett, with a nice donation. Thanks, Garrett. Welcome to California, both you and Quinn. Oh, no need to read this live. Okay, it's just chat me up. Okay, cool. So I'll check that out. And yeah, if you're sending me a message that you don't want me to read out, out loud, cough, cough, Delise, uh, put, a, put a little note on the top. Say so. That's always good. Get yourself in trouble. <laughs> Anyways. So there are no horses at the Red Wedding, guys, of course. But George does work them in via Arya's perspective from outside the wedding. Check this out. It was only then that she heard the riders pouring out of the castle gate in a river of steel and fire, the thunder of their destriers crossing the drawbridge almost lost beneath the drumming from the castles. So that's a very nice merging of the thunderous boom doom drums and the thunderous hoofbeats. And the fact that the drumming from the castle is almost loud enough to cover up the horse's hoofbeats really drives home the point about how friggin' loud they were. The horses are pouring out of the castle in a river of steel and fire. And of course, fiery horses make you think of the Dothraki and their beliefs that the stars above are a celestial calisar of fiery horses. So a river of fiery horses and steel pouring out of a place where Nissa Nissa is being sacrificed. Well, that makes you think of the exploding moon, needless to say, the waves of night and blood which was a storm of swords and a shower of bleeding stars. And of course the twins could be taken as a two moons clue, certainly, but we'll have to do a fray symbolism blowout some other time. All right. And, oh, let me get back on a tab here. Wait, wait. And I'm seeing some love for Danny, uh, the Danny stream that I did with Elisa, that's cool. Yeah, and definitely subscribe to Elisa's channel, everyone, and watch those videos. You won't be sorry. Also, Elisa shows off a little bit of her cosplay, which she's into. She's working on uh, developing a good Alisan cosplay, too, which is awesome. Good Queen Alisan. So, when you think about it, guys, there's also some serious Hammer of the Waters vibes going on here. Thousands of captive men are being slaughtered, and Catelyn, the weirwood goddess, has her face carved and gets the entire stigmata. This is when the moon should be broken and the hammer dropped. And indeed, we get a river of fiery horses and steel pouring out. Giant burning tents covered in oil to simulate the burning skin of the moon. That's another line of symbolism we explored a different time. We also see the last hero being killed in the form of Rob and Jingle Bell Aegon, who's also a stag man, of course. Uh, but the suggestion of mending the dead men is made and Rob is symbolically resurrected as the wolf man. Um... And all, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I screwed that whole last sentence up. Rewind. We also see the last hero killed, and the suggestion of the dead, mending the dead men is made. Rob is symbolically resurrected as the wolf man, and all the while, the drums boom, and the horse's hooves pound. So, pretty good stuff. And just to be clear, hammer of the waters, thousands of captives were fed to the weirwood, faces were carved, hammer was dropped, and that all, it's all happening here. So, very cool. Oh, Elisa, you are totally worthy. Totally worthy. Contribute a lot to the community. And so the last boom dooming, it comes in John's Azor High Dream. Oh my, yes, that's right. And this is the opening of John's A Dance with Dragons chapter that has that dream. That night he dreamt of wildlings howling from the woods, advancing to the moan of war horns and the roll of drums. Boom doom, boom doom, boom doom came the sound. A thousand hearts with a single beat. Some had spears and some had bows and some had axes. Others rode on chariots made of bone, drawn by teams of dogs as big as ponies. Giants slumbered amongst them, 40 feet tall, with malls the size of oak trees. Stand fast, Jon Snow called. Throw them back. He stood atop the wall alone. Flame, he cried. Feed them flame. But there was no one to pay heed. Now, as we know, these wildling attackers sort of transforming in the manner of dreams into the army of undead and invading ice spiders. They're scuttling up the ice. John will meet them with armor made of black ice and a blade that burns red in his fist, even though he defends the lands of the living alone. 
This is John as Azor Ahai and the Last Hero. And amidst it all, you find the drums rolling like a thousand hearts with a single beat. That's that's very similar to that Battle of the Blackwater line, where all the wooden, uh, the winged horse ships are, you know, churn, churning the water. And the drums are beating with a single beat or wooden heart with a single, I forget what the line, you remember what it was. Anyways, so this may end up being a clue that this is no ordinary dream here that John is having but rather what you might call a green dream or one that's perhaps being implanted or messed with by Blood Raven. I think that is the case probably. Um, the dream ends with a mysterious gnarled hand seizing John by the shoulder and waking him up. And many speculate that's the hand of Blood Raven since gnarled is a word basically only used to describe trees and roots and old men. So it could be Blood Raven reaching into the dream to sort of wake him up there. Because remember, he was getting pretty upset. <laughs> the world was dissolving into a red mist, and he was basically just, like, killing everything. So might have been time to wake him up. Yeah, a thousand hearts with a single beat, a thousand eyes in one. Pretty obvious parallel there. So, you know, if we think about the fact that it's the other, like, wildlings playing the drums in the scene, it could imply the others can attack via the weirwood net, which I think they can. The HBO showed Night's King being able to contact Brain on the astral plane, and I suspect... There is some related truth in the books waiting to be discovered, as I've talked about. Or it may be that we're not meant to think about who's playing the drums in John's dream, since the dream doesn't actually say who is playing them, but sort of renders them as disembodied booming, kind of like Theon seen in the Winterfell Godswood. In this case, the message may be that the last hero has to be aided in his battle by the power of the Weirwoods. And of course, that's... That's what we're told, right? The last hero got help from the children of the forest before turning the tide against the others. And it could be that we're supposed to see John as a last hero whose journey to the astral plane to do battle against the true enemy. Uh, I'm sorry. It could be that we're supposed to see John as a last hero who has to journey to the astral plane. Now, that's probably going to be Bran's job, I would think. But I would basically see Bran and John very much as partners. And th they're both avatars or champions of the weirwood john might be the physical avatar of the weirwood and if again if john looks like ghost with red eyes and white hair he will literally look like a weirwood tree i i, I really think that's what's going to happen and bran would sort of be the the uh, astral plane champion the champion of the weirwood net so i think they'll support each other and work together bran might even use the weirwood net to help john resurrect there's a lot of ways that those two could cross over so there you go, guys. That is the first half of this. Actually, it's more than half. That was about two thirds. Yeah, that was. That was like two thirds. Um, but now we're getting into the Dunkin' Egg section, which is I've sort of saved for the end. It's it's just really fun symbolism. I'm going to have a good hearty har with this. So let me just check in with the chat here. How many people are watching? 245. Oh, my goodness. On a Thursday. Love you guys. Thank you very much. Make sure you click and like, everyone. How are we enjoying the thing so far? So this is really good symbolism. It's really fun. Uh, you, we're learning a little bit about Norse mythology here. I think that is kind of the point of what George is doing, including all the symbolism. But I, I just find this concept to be really cool. A bunch of people playing drums and the shamans entering the trance and people perceive that as like an invisible horse. It's a horse that you can't see galloping. So... We are going to, if you're thinking about the, the stallion who mounts the world and the prophecy of Rego, you know, being the stallion, the prince is riding and all that stuff. Yes, absolutely. That is more astral projection, shamanic horse stuff. And that will come in the next episode, which I'm probably going to call the stallion who mounts. So that is, um, oh, I'm not done, by the way. We're only, again, two thirds of the way through. So don't let anyone go anywhere. <laughs> We're not done. I'm just sort of collecting my breath and resetting here before we go into the very cool scene from the mystery night, which is the one where, um, is it the mystery night? No, I'm sorry. It's not the mystery night. It's the hedge night. It's the one where dunk gets in trouble with Arian bright flame and ends up having to fight in a trial of seven. So let me get a drink real quick here. And yeah, if you haven't read Dunkin' Egg, definitely do. Dunkin' Egg is awesome. And if you've ever doubted my theories, Dunkin' Egg will bring you to your knees. Um, it's so packed with symbolism, it's not even funny. 
it's very clear that by the time George wrote the first Duncan Egg book, which I believe was in between the second and third or the third and fourth, I forget. Um, but by the time he wrote the first Duncan Egg book, he had everything worked out because all the symbolism is there. It's very advanced. In a Game of Thrones, there are some scenes in which you can tell George is still developing the basic symbolism uh, of it all. But by the time we get to the first Duncan Egg book, it is like straight up, it's, it's full on. So this is gonna be a ton of fun. Let me just mute my screen for one second so we don't get in trouble with the law. Johnny YouTube law. By the way, I, I made a post about this. Um, if you've been watching my live streams on a delay lately, there's been a crap ton of ads for some of you. I fixed that. It was a weird YouTube algorithm gone haywire thing. Uh, YouTube has always done a really good job of automatically placing ads in every so often. And I've let them do it automatically. There's a choice where you can do it on your own. It's a little more work. But I've let them go because they've been doing a good job. All of a sudden, they started doing a very bad job. And it was like one ad every three minutes in the first half hour and then no ads for the rest of the stream. It was very strange. Anyway, I fixed it all. So if you've been annoyed by that, it shouldn't happen again. And thanks for bearing with me. Praise God. Yeah, and I'm not even going on the time anymore. Not even caring about that. So you want to change my glasses up. I feel like seeing you all a little better. Oh, these are a little dirty. <clears throat> a Knight of the Hedge. <clears throat> uh, that one was Banana Jack, which is tasty, very potent. We've also got some wedding cake in the house. Here in California, where these things are legal, 100% legal. We would never endorse illegal activity on this YouTube channel. Mad Otters, that was yours. Cool. So a Knight of the Hedge. Hold on, one more good cough and I'll be good. So one of the most tightly packed examples of this line of symbolism comes to us in the form of our friend, Sir Duncan the Tall, who has a certain kind of Odin symbolism. As a hedge knight, he's someone who lives under bushes, which are like small trees. We want a shrubbery, just as a green seer lives under a tree. He also prefers, um, he also, I'm sorry, refers, he also, <laughs> refer, refers, Oh, sublime shout out. Sorry. He also refers to the elm tree under which he makes his camp at the beginning of the tournament as his pavilion, enhancing the idea of Dunk living under a tree like a green seer. At the end of the novella, Dunk has a conversation with Makar Targaryen under the elm tree, and they're talking about talking to the trees. Dunk says... Uh, Dunk asks why the, oh, I'm sorry. So Dunk is actually talking to the tree. He doesn't know that Makar is there. And he asks the tree why he lived. And then Makar walks up and says, what answer does your tree give you? And then speaks um, about the High Septon saying that no man can understand the gods. But maybe the, the, maybe the High Septon should try sleeping under a tree because that way he'd understand the gods, right? So. It's a funny little exchange. It's all talking about green seers living under the trees and dreaming, talking to the gods through the trees, etc., etc. So in the Sworn Sword, Dunk carries a shield with a hanged man swinging grim and gray beneath a gallows tree. <laughs> you guys know what that means, right? And in the Mystery Knight, Dunk enters the tourney as the Gallows Knight. So... He lives under a tree, and he rides the gallows tree. You guys are following me here, right? His horse, if you recall, is named Thunder. Ah, it's a thundering shamanic horse for the hanged man who rides the gallows tree. That's pretty terrific. I mean, as 
these are very clear references to both Sleipnir and Yggdrasil. And it's very, very tightly overlaid, correlated. Just love that stuff. So this demonstrates that George is well familiar with the idea of the gallows tree being like a thunderous horse. And as we'll see, he's riding it for all he's got, that George Martin. So Dunk eventually paints over the Gallows Knight sigil with a new one, and it's the one behind me. It's a falling star and an elm tree on a field of sunset, which gives us a terrific portrait. I'm sorry, gives us a terrific portrait of the thunderbolt meteor which set fire to the tree in the Grey King myth, which of course is just myth speak for the meteors falling and affecting the weirdness. It's basically the moment right before the falling star hits the tree. And appropriately, it's happening as the sun is about to disappear on a field of sunset. So in the hedge night, and so let me just, just to make sure this, drive this home. The two sigils tell the story. The green seer kind of guy rides the gallows tree, and then a star flies through the air and comes crashing to the ground, causes the sunset. There you go. And this is like the Grey King myth of the lightning bolt striking the tree and conveying the fire of the gods to man. So now, in the Hedge Knight, the story takes place at the tourney of Ashford Meadow. Ha <laughs> ha! And Dunk is the ash tree in the meadow, so to speak. It starts with the dream uh, of Dar uh, the, a dream that Daron the drunkard Targaryen had about Dunk's deeds at Ashford. My dreams are not like yours, Sir Duncan. Mine are true. They frighten me. You frighten me. I dreamed of you in a dead dragon, you see. A great beast, huge, with wings so large they could cover this meadow. It had fallen on top of you, but you were alive, and the dragon was dead. That, dread de uh, that dead dragon, of course, turns out to be Baylor Targaryen, who tragically dies from a blow that he took during the tourney. But in terms of mythical astronomy, the dead dragon is a symbol of the black moon meteor, a piece of the dead moon. And that's what strikes the tree. And Dunk is the Odin figure, is the tree set ablaze by this thunderbolt meteor. And of course, this is reinforced when Dunk is squaring off lance to lance against Aryan bright flame Targaryen at the end of the trial of seven that is held here to decide Dunk's fate. Arion's shield and Morningstar will play the role of the falling dragon and Dunk will be described in wooden tree person language. So Dunk is riding thunder and he's repeating to himself, I am thunder and thunder is me. We are one beast. We are joined. We are one. So Dunk is wedding the thunder tree. In other words, he's becoming the tree. And a moment later, it says, my lance is a part of my arm. It's my finger, a wooden finger. All I need to do is touch him with my long wooden finger. So Dunk symbolizes a green seer hooked up to a tree. He's mounted on the thunder horse and he wants to reach out and touch the dragon with his wooden finger. And this is very like the scene at the night fort, right? Where the twisted weirwood reaches out with the bone white branches to drag the moon down into the well. Dragons come from the moon when the green seer reaches out to touch it, which is something that he can do with an astral projection tree horse. So Dunk reaches out with his wooden finger and does indeed touch the three-headed dragon on Arion's shield. And it, that's a circular shape containing three dragons. So it's a great symbol of the moon, which gives birth to dragons. Because when Danny did her whole ritual, we got three dragons hatching from stone eggs. You know, the moon was an egg. So Dunk is reaching out with a wooden finger. He's touching a moon dragon symbol. Then Dunk takes a wound. Right as he does this, because there's a simultaneous hit, that symbolizes the death transformation of Azor Ahai, the naughty green seer, because it's no ordinary wound. Dunk actually gets impaled by Arion's lance, which is a, almost the same wound that Beric suffers, except for it pierces Dunk a little closer to his side than his heart, and it doesn't kill him. So Dunk is a hanged man, and now he's pierced while riding the thunder horse. <clears throat> and remember that some versions of the myth have Odin also pierced to Yggdrasil when he's riding it and being ha uh, hang uh, hung on it. So the one eye wound is also coming, fear not. So George, he does, like I said, he doesn't hold back. 
He wants us to know that what, what, what symbolism we're talking about. He doesn't want us to have any doubts. That's what I say anyways. Now, this is also about Jesus, I should mention, because Jesus, of course, was hung on the cross, which is a gallows tree, and he was also pierced to it. Now, Jesus's body, while still hanging on the cross, like I said, he was stabbed in the side by the centurion spear, and Dunk's wound stabbed in the side by a lance. So it's a very good parallel to Jesus's wound. Now, Jesus's hanging on the cross is, of course, of course, a death and resurrection story. A horth of the horth, a horth of course. It's a death and resurrection story. Jesus rises harder and stronger from the grave, right? <clears throat> I mean, don't you remember that verse in Matthew chapter 9 where it talks about Jesus seeing the runes? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm joking. But of course, Jesus on the cross and Odin on Yggdrasil is a very similar image. And it's really the same mythical archetype. Absolutely. It's the, it's the dying God archetype. Now, these and other similarities between Norse myth and Christianity actually helped facilitate the wholesale acceptance of Christianity by the Vikings, or nearly wholesale and fairly rapid acceptance of Christianity. It was fertile ground. The preachers of the new religion were talking about a guy being hung on a cross who transcended death. And the Vikings are basically like, oh, yeah, no, I, I totally get that. It makes perfect sense. We're supposed to drink his blood. Oh, yeah, cool. I mean, how else to become like a god, right? Or they may have just said, you guys call Odin what now? J, 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 Zeus? So, sorry for my loose lips there with uh, with my with the names of classic deities. Uh, did I miss a chat, J Lord? Let me go back. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, I totally, J Lord, I might have. The only one I see from you recently is the one asking me if I got your Stark chat. So just repeat the question and tag me if you would, and I'll read it. And I'll also check in on the PayPal email. That looks the same as it was, okay. So J Lord, yeah, just repeat your question and tag me here. Let's see. Um, so we're per uh, returning to impaled Sir Duncan. Dunk pulls the lance out of his side and the blood flows and it says, the world swam and he almost fell. That's a nice reference to the global floods brought on by the moon meteor impacts. And you guys remember that's often a flood of blood or moon blood that happens. So then Dunk tosses his star and elm shield to the ground. And that gives us a pretty good idea of the star falling to earth. And you could even look at that as planting a tree because he's sort of just putting the tree on the ground there. It's Dunk's sigil come to life basically. Dunk looks around for Arion, having lost sight of him. And then it says, the sound of drumming hooves behind him made Dunk turn his head sharply. So Arion is personifying the meteors themselves. And his coming can also include the shamanic horse drumming as well. And if you had any doubt, the thunder of the horse hooves, it's literally called drumming. So there it is. Sleipnir is a gray horse too. And Arion's drumming horse is also gray. Then Arion knocks Dunk off of his thunder horse properly this time, and Dunk's long sword goes spinning from his grasp, which is cool. That gives us like the flying sword symbolism. Then Pain stabs through him, and that gives us another impalement idea. So he's been stabbed by Pain and by the lance. Then it says he can't see because of the mud in his visor. And that gives us an idea of Odin's eye being torn out, and that's going to be followed up on again in a minute. So Dunk wipes the mud from his eye slit, and then it says, through his fingers, he glimpsed a dragon flying and a spiked morning star whirling on the end of a chain. So through his wooden fingers, his tree fingers, remember, he can glimpse the flying dragon and a morning star, or maybe a flying morning star dragon. That's a clue about using the trees to see into space, I would think. And this is also where I got the idea for the old Weirwood Compendium logo, if you remember. It's sort of looking upward through a canopy of trees uh, at a huge fireball falling to earth. <laughs> so I was thinking about this moment, looking through the trees to see the morning star dragon falling. Pretty cool. So the action continues. Then his head seemed to burst to pieces. When his eyes opened, he was on the ground again, sprawled on his back. The mud had all been knocked from his helm, 
but now one eye was closed by blood. So he's got a blood eye. Above was nothing but dark gray sky. J Lord, I'm looking to see if you repeated your question. I don't see it yet. All right, let's see here. Um, so this is cool. There's the one eye symbolism, right? The morning star strikes Dunk, then his head bursts to pieces. So this is a big clue that Dunk is also symbolizing the moon as well as the tree set on fire. And that makes sense because Weirwoods and the moon are always symbolically equated with each other. And so that's what Dunk's crashing to earth is about. He's a piece of moon crashing to earth. His head is bursting. Um, and then let's see what else we've got here. Dunk's uh, exploding head, like I said, it's the moon. It's also the tree being struck by the morning star dragon, which is like a thunderbolt. So a tree man riding a thunder horse is knocked to earth by a flying dragon. And we can see Dunk as the naughty boy, essentially, who climbs two highs and struck down by lightning. That's, that's what Bran does. It's the green seer language. It's the role that Bran plays. And sure enough, one of Dunk's eyes is now closed by blood. So he's got the Odin transformation. He's pulled down the moon basically on top of his head and paid the price of possessing the fire of the gods. That's how we can see this. Like the green seer is reaching up for the moon, kind of gets more than what he's bargained for gets hit by a meteor. He dies and becomes an Odin figure, something like that. So it says, and above nothing but a dark gray sky. So the sun is hidden. There's dark gray clouds. J Lord is repeating his question with another super chat. Keeping me, keeping the bank account full. Thanks, J Lord. In the books, the Starks are, no, no, I got that. Yeah, we talked about that. I totally got that one. Did you step out for a second? I chatted it up. I said, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm on board. You're, you're, you're winning me over to the Starks as Pearl Emperors reincarnate. And Bran has to be carried around, so maybe he'll get like a Pearl Palanquin uh, sort of thing. Yeah. Anyways, don't mind answering twice because J-Lord has been ringing the dial so many times. All right. So, well, uh, John Isai's... Uh, the moon isn't always a woman. Yeah, there, there are male moon figures. Dunk is a male moon figure. Um, Garth is often a male moon figure. Septon Moon we had. Uh, a lot of the resurrected figures become like reborn moons. You know, the moon drowns and comes again. So, yeah. And we've also got female solar figures uh, like... Uh, Nymeria, thank you. Nymeria sits in the sun throne and rules Dorne. The maiden made of light is a sun goddess figure. Ariane, yep, that would be another one. So, yeah, the, the gender is not always fixed. Usually solar king male, moon maiden female, but it is occasionally the other way around. And there's also gender flip characters too, like Arya. And even John is called a maid a few times. So there's a few things going on there. In any case, oh, Sam is another male moon figure. So the sun's hidden, guys. Odin transformation has happened for Dunk. He's pulled the moon down, got hit by a morning star, one eye. The sun is hidden. Then a moment later, it says, the dragon appeared over him. Three heads it had and wings bright as flame, red and yellow and orange. It was laughing. Are you dead yet, Hedge Knight? It asked. Cry for quarter and admit your guilt. And perhaps I'll only claim a hand and a foot. Oh, and those teeth. But what are a few teeth? A man like you can live years on peas porridge. The dragon laughed again. No, eat this then. The spiked ball whirled round and round the sky and fell towards his head as fast as a shooting star. So there's our final confirmation that the flying dragon morning star is a falling star symbol. Told you guys, Duncan, egg symbolism is the best. Anyways, we see the implication of the naughtiness of the naughty green seers, right? Dunk is told to declare his guilt He's just pulled down the moon. Arion will only claim a hand and a foot, with the hand being an obvious call out to the idea of the exploding moon as a fiery hand. And again, think of Jamie's cut off hand, John's bloody hand, all the hand wounds. It's many episodes ago, but that's an old symbol. Oh, Davos, the shortened fingers. Now the foot wound, I'm not sure about, could be crippling like Bran. Uh, but if Dunk has his teeth pulled out, well then he's gonna have a bloody toothless mouth 
just like a weirwood tree, which has a bloody toothless mouth. He already has one eye, something uh, like uh, bloody weeping eyes of the weirwoods. So this is the entire, he's got the whole, you know, weirwood stigmata to go along with the Odin makeover, I guess you could say. And then of course, Arion tells Dunk that a man like him could live for years on porridge. And I probably don't have to tell you that this is an allusion to weirwood paste, a paste of weirwood seeds. You can live for years on that stuff, y'all. Years, like 137 or however old Blood Raven is. Dunk is the tree struck by the falling star. He's the Odin-esque green seer. So it makes sense that he should eat paste and live for years. Lots of fun. So the battle finishes with Dunk reaching up with a fist, just like Gregor at the Oberon fight, or like Storm's End like a fist, and the fist of the first men. Dunk reaches up with his fist, and he pulls down the bright flame dragon into the mud, just like Gregor pulling the solar figure Oberon down and smashing his face. It's this almost the same fight sequence here. This rising fist that comes after the moon falls that is the rising smoke and ash that blots out the sun. That's the important thing about the sequence here. You pull down the moon, the moon crashes, then the dark star crashes, you know, and then the smoke and ash rises up. It's like a mushroom cloud. It's like an ash tree and it blots out the sun. And that's what happens in the Oberon fight. That rising fist literally smashes Oberon, pulls him down, then he headbutts him and smashes his face. And he gets blood on the fist. So you even have the bloody hand weirwood symbol. So here the, with the dunk fight, um, think about bright flame as the sun. His shield is the thing that had the three-headed dragon sigil. That was the moon. Arion is the bright dragon. So he is the Azora high figure who turns the moon into his weapon, into his dragons just as the exploding moon is like the weapon of the sun, which appears to stand behind the moon. Because again, it's an eclipse alignment. The moon is standing in front of the sun. So you have Arion the sun and the moon in front of him, that's his shield. And then you have Dunk the green seer reaching up and cracking the shield open and then pulling down the sun from behind the moon. So it's really good stuff. So what we've got here is Dunk's rising fist pulling down Arion, the sun figure, after the moon shield has been shattered like a rain of morning star dragons. Now Dunk rolls on top of Arion and thinks, let him swing his bloody morning star now, which is cool because that gives us the bleeding star idea. And then just to demonstrate the idea of the moon sort of having its revenge on the sun by darkening its face with the moon meteor smoke, Dunk takes Arion's three-headed moon dragon shield and bashes Arion's head with it. He bashes his dragon helm and smashes it. And this is very like Gregor bashing Oberon's solar face in after having fallen to the ground. And it, by the end, it says, uh, it says there, by the end, the bright prince was as brown as a privy and Oberon's face was literally smashed. Think also of Joffrey at the Red Wedding. He's a solar king. His face turns purple when he dies. So it gets dark. Then just to cap things off, Dunk finally has Arion at his mercy. It says, his eyes were purple and full of terror. Dunk had a sudden urge to grab one, pop it like a grape between two steel fingers, but that would not be knightly. So you guys, you got two Odin makeovers for the price of one. What a bargain, right? This emphasizes that the falling meteor dragon and the tree it strikes sort of become one. The sun and moon become one. The green seer and the tree become one one so <clears throat> there you go <clears throat> so we got a couple of the people fighting on team dunk that are worth taking a quick look at lionel baratheon the laughing storm he's a bona fide stag man horned lord storm king figure then there's robin risling who has one eye missing <laughs> and seriously you guys there's more one-eyed people in a song of ice and fire than you remember val rides a one-eyed horse uh, there's also a version of the Summer King and Winter King myth that uses a Robin and a Wren that don't, I don't have time to go into, but suffice it to say that the name Robin can be used as a green man illusion. So there's a couple of green men on Dunk's team. That's pretty cool. 
The other notable member of Team Dunk is the dead dragon from Daron's Dream, which is Baylor Breakspear. He wore the black armor. He was the dragon who fell on Dunk and died. So he's a falling moon dragon symbol. Baylor took a blow from his brother's mace, but didn't die until he removed his helm. And then part of the skull fell out, which is a very grisly depiction of the moon losing its shell, right? Right before that, he was feeling dizzy. And he says his fingers feel like wood, which brings us full circle back to Dunk's wooden fingers and shows us again that both Dunk the tree man and the dragon that falls on him are one and the same and they join and have the same symbolism of that of the burning tree. Um, and so there you go. Once they've merged, they show the same symbols. So Dunk also sees red blood and pale bone on the side of Baylor's head. And blood and bone, of course, that's the language of the weirwood coloring. It's used like 20 times in the book, blood and bone. So this reinforces the idea of, um, <clears throat> like I said, Baylor the dragon dying and merging with the weirwood net. He's turning into blood and bone. Then as he dies, it says a queer look passed, a queer troubled look passed across Baylor Breakspear's face like a cloud passing before a sun, Re which reinforces the idea of blotting out the sun by pulling down a dragon. I don't know what else to say. <clears throat> so there's an, and then you guys might remember this. It was a strange sounding line at the end, which I think I can make sense of now. It's right after Baylor starts to fall. Dunk caught him. Up, they say, he said, just as he had with thunder in the melee. Up, up. But he never remembered that afterward, and the prince did not rise. So in case you need another clue about the falling dragon being the same as the thunderbolt, there you go. Dunk has equated the fallen dragon with his horse thunder, which also implies the dragon riding the thunder horse. It's pretty great. Also, it implies the idea of raising Azor high from the dead, right? Dunk is some sort of green seer, tree man, and he's trying to raise a dragon from the dead. It's pretty good. So there you go, guys. The moral of the story is that if you're a naughty green seer and you mount the thunder horse to try to pull down the moon, you're going to get yourself hit on the head with a morning star dragon, with a falling star, falling piece of moon. This kind of gets back to the fundamental question that's been lingering for quite a while. How exactly does a green seer pull down a moon? If it didn't just happen by accident, we need a way for human sorcerers to reach up into the heavens. The idea of the weirwoods as a vehicle for astral projection seems like the beginning of an answer to this vexing question. We've seen these weirwoods reaching into the heavens, scratching at the moon, trying to pull down the moon, reaching for the sun, blocking out the sun in a couple of quotes I didn't mention. We're being told they're a vehicle that enables you to fly. So is this a coincidence? Or is this flying have to do with cracking the moon open? So there you go, guys. That is Weird Compendium 9, Shamanic Thunder Horse. Summer Girl. You are, uh, you didn't miss most of it. We're, we're almost done here. We've been going for a, an hour and 53 minutes. <clears throat> Pretty good stuff, right? You guys have fun with, uh, with that Dunkin' Egg stuff there? I was, um, Uh, hang on a second. Let me do something. Ah. Okay, never mind. So yeah, this is this is pretty good stuff. Pretty good stuff. Um, that is hated it. <laughs> totally, totally. Dunkin' Egg has always been you know near and dear to my heart because of the symbolism. I've been waiting to unleash this on you guys. I wrote. This first, my first draft of this, what I just read to you with, with that scene more than two years ago. And it just got sidelined and I went in other directions and 
set my life on fire and all kinds of other things happened and came back around. And now we are all the way back to these ideas. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation. We're going to go of, um, we're going to pick up pretty much right where we left off in the next Weirwood Compendium episode. I might try to get this ready for next week, maybe Sunday or maybe during the week. I'm not sure how that schedule is going to go, but I will try to bring it to you soon. Um, I chopped off a big part of the script from this one that was going to go on this one. It's basically we're going to get into Rago, the stallion who mounts the world prophecy and the foreshadowing of Danny and Bran flying to the stars or having something to do with all of that. So if you guys want a little more, I do have a couple of Bran quotes that I have saved. I don't have them scripted out, but I took all the quotes with Bran riding his horse, Dancer, and I uh, found a few things, right? So this, the whole point of this is that Bran is the green seer who's going to be riding, he's going to be riding the weirwood tree horse, right? So I haven't, we didn't talk about Bran very much in this episode. And so I went back and well, I was like, well, let's look at the scenes where Bran's actually riding a horse. I'll check this out. It says, go, Bran whispered to his own horse. He touched her neck lightly and the small chestnut filly started forward. So chestnut filly, first of all, chestnut is a type of tree. So this tree is implied as a horse. It's a tree horse. Of course it is. Bran had named her Dancer. She was two years old, and Joseph said that she was smarter than any horse had a right to be. Of course she's smart. She's she's a symbol of the weirwood net. They had trained her special to respond to rain and voice and touch. Up to now, Bran had only ridden her around the yard. At first, Joseph, or Hodor, would lead her, while Bran sat strapped to her back in the oversized saddle the imp had drawn up for him. But the past fortnight, he had been riding her on his own, trotting her round and round and growing bolder with every circuit. So we even have a great like world tree sort of orbiting the universe symbolism. He's riding the horse round and round and round, which creates that sort of solar system symbolism. And he's growing bolder. So he's growing with the horse that's like a chestnut tree. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, then it says uh, they go, of course, for a walk down to the stream where they meet the wildlings and stuff. And that one starts off, it says, Rob smiled as you will. He sent his gelding into a trot. The wolves raced after him. Bran snapped the rein sharply and Dancer picked up her pace. He heard a, th uh, <laughs> he heard a shout from Theon Greyjoy and the hoofbeats of the other horses behind him. Bran's cloak billowed out, rippling in the wind and the snow seemed to rush at his face. Rob was well ahead, glancing back over his shoulder from time to time to make sure Bran and the others were following. He snapped the reins again. Smooth as silk, Dancer slid into a gallop. The distance closed. By the time he caught Rob on the edge of the wolf's wood, two miles beyond the winter town, they had left the others well behind. I can ride, Bran shouted, grinning. It felt almost as good as flying. So this is great. This, um, this gives you the flying and the riding horse thing tied together. And of course, this horse again is like a tree. So it's a flying tree horse. But this whole scene is about fleeing the others, isn't it? There's three uses of the word others. It says, um, the hoofbeats of the other horses behind them. Then the snow is rushing at their face. So it's like a snow, they're in a snowstorm. And then they're glancing back to make sure Bran and the others were following. So the others are following Bran. And then it says, by the time he caught Rob on the edge of the wolf's wood, they had left the others behind. And now he can fly. So that's interesting. That's like flying. And I, yeah, I just found this this morning, guys. So I haven't analyzed this to death. Um, but yeah, this seems like, you know, Rob is basically a stand in for John here. So there's something about Rob and John fleeing into the heart of winter, fleeing the others and something like that. I don't know. It's pretty cool. Pretty good quote there. So this a uh, little bit later on in the same chapter, it says the stream was running high and fast. Rob dismounted and led his gelding across the ford. So they're crossing a river. In the deepest part of the crossing, the water came up to mid-thigh. He tied his horse to a tree on the far side and waded back across for, Dan uh, for Bran and Dancer. Um, the current foamed around rock and root, and Bran could feel the spray of it on his face as Rob led him over, it made him smile. For a moment, he felt strong again and whole. He looked up at the trees and dreamed of climbing them right up to the very top with the whole forest spread out beneath him. 
So he's dreaming of climbing trees, but all of this is foreshadowing for him dreaming through weirwood trees, of course. Um, and, you know, up to the top with the forest spread out beneath him. So it's almost like he's flying. Then they were on the, uh, picking up the text again. They were on the far side when they heard a howl, a long rising wail that moved through the trees like a cold wind. That's cool, a wailing wind. Nissa Nissa's cry, perhaps, moving through the trees, calling the long night, the cold wind. Bran raised his head to listen. Summer, he said. No sooner had he spoken than a second voice joined the first. So they cross the river, and then the wolves come, and then the wildlings come, too. And in the middle of the confrontation with the wildlings, Rob appears like the hero, and it says, Put down your steel now, and I promise you shall have a quick and painless death, Rob called out. Bran looked up in desperate hope, and there he was. The strength of the words were undercut by the way his voice cracked with strain. He was mounted, the bloody carcass of an elk slung across the back of his horse, his sword in a gloved hand. The brother, said the man with the gray stubbly face. So that's pretty cool. Rob the hero shows up with a dead elk. So that could be implying Rob as a resurrected stag man, which is the last heroes always have resurrected stag man. Cold hands is a resurrected stag man. John symbolically will be a resurrected stag man and that he's a skin changer, he's a, you know, a green person. So here we have Rob with a dead stag and he's showing up as the hero. His voice is cracking like an other though. That's kind of interesting. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe he's like the good other, but there you go. He's the brother. So Hodor hummed, Hodor becomes Bran's horse after he stops riding Dancer and there's a line where it says, Little Walder cast his splintered lance aside, spied Bran, and reined up. Now there is an ugly horse, he said of Hodor. Hodor is no horse, Bran said. Hodor, said Hodor. Now, Hodor is not a horse, but Bran does ride Hodor in that wicker basket. And the wicker basket itself is, of course, a weirwood tree symbol. We remember all that wicker man type thing. And the wicker basket, uh, oh, here, let me read the quote about the wicker basket. It says, Hodor hummed tunelessly as he went down hand under hand, Bran bouncing against his back in the wicker seat that Maester Lewin had fashioned for him. Lewin had gotten the idea from the baskets the women used to carry firewood on their backs. After that, it had been a simple matter of cutting leg, leg holes and attaching some new straps to spread Bran's weight more evenly. It was not as good as riding Dancer, but there were places Dancer could not go, and this did not shame Bran the way it did when Hodor carried him in his arms like a baby. Hodor seemed to like it too, though with Hodor it was hard to tell. The only tricky part was doors. Doors. That's some clear hold, hold the door foreshadowing from George. Sometimes Hodor forgot that he had Bran on his back, and that could be painful when he went through a door. For near a fortnight, there had been so many comings and goings that Rob ordered both portcullises kept up and the drawbridge down beneath them, even in the dead of night. So I forgot to mention before, anytime you see fortnight, you should wonder if that's talking about the night fort and the long night. And indeed, they're talking about the dead of night. So fortnight, dead of night, and we're talking about what? Foreshadowing of, of hold the door. Bran is riding around on Hodor. They're talking about doors. Also, the bit about the wicker basket being used to, um, used to hold firewood. That implies Bran as firewood, meaning a burning tree. And of course, the weirwoods are burning trees. So Bran riding Dancer, the horse that's like a tree. Bran riding Hodor that's like a horse in a wicker basket. Bran riding the tree. It's all of the same line of symbolism. And this does happen, you know, at the night fort. Bran, in fact, skin changes Hodor at the night fort in the dead of night. So pretty good stuff here. And then last, we've got the very sad death of Dancer. Because he dies... Dancer apparently dies when Winterfell is burnt. So it took the rest of the morning to make a slow circuit of the castle. We're orbiting the castle again. The great granite walls remained, blackened here and there by fire, but otherwise untouched. But within, all was death and destruction. The doors of the great hall were charred and smoldering, and inside the rafters had given way, and the whole roof had crashed down onto the floor. So the sky has fallen, if you will. We've got burning wooden doors. Weirwood, our, weirwood doors are kind of a symbol, so there you go. The green and yellow panes of the glass gardens were all in shards. Broken glass, that's cool, glass shards. 
the tree and fruit, uh, trees and fruits and flowers torn up and left exposed to die. Of the stables made of wooden thatch, nothing remained but ashes, embers, and dead horses. Bran thought of his dancer and wanted to weep. The thing is, ashen embers and dead horses, that's exactly what is left in Drogo's funeral pyre. Literally those words, ashes, embers, and the bones of, of a dead horse. Um, Dancer is a mare, I think so, yes. Which gives more moon symbolism because Stella Mara um, and all that stuff. And also the sea symbolism of the word M-E-R, like mermaid. Very cool. Um, so that, that correlation to Drogo's Pyre is really important. We're going to start off the next Weirwood Compendium episode recapping Drogo's Pyre. But we talked about it in Weirwood Compendium 8. There's the gray horse of smoke and fire seeming to the gray smoky stallion rising from the pyre that Danny sees Drogo as mounting. That is an image of Sleipnir, the gray horse. Drogo is a solar king riding the horse up to the stars. So it's, again, astral projection horse. He grows up and he kind of mounts the red comet in terms of symbolism. And then Danny is reborn in the ashes with the dragons. And here we have the death of Bran's horse, Dancer, amidst the ashes, embers, and uh, dead horses. So very cool. That will do it, folks. Uh, I will take any questions that you might have. Last call for Super Chats. Last call for Mythical Astronomy. PayPal.me donations, which you can send a question in. Or just regular old questions. My head is starting to swim, actually. I think I need food or something. Nick Bird with the 420. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Woo, yeah, I totally am getting swimmy in the head. Cranking out the symbolism. Guys, the last podcast I did, the Weirwood Symbolism Overview, that is by far the most symbolism I've ever explained in one sitting. I just summarized like eight two-hour episodes <laughs> in three and a half hours and uh man that was that was something else so you guys that watched that i hope you enjoyed that that was history right there that was mythical astronomy history that we made together <clears throat> so yes thank you mods you guys are great always helping me out remember to click like and leave a comment on your way out make sure you're subscribed to the channel Mm. Yeah, I'll drink more. I'll drink some non-vitamin water water in just a second. But there you go. That was an awful lot of horse symbolism and lots of flying and astral projection and especially witchy, trippy episode appropriately titled Shamanic Thunder Horse. <clears throat> hey, Carol Funk, yep, you have to watch a replay. Have to watch the replay. And yes, here's the Patreon link. Of course, you can find the Patreon linked at uh, LuciferMeansLightbringer.com. You can just search Patreon on Lucifer Means Lightbringer. Very easy to find things nowadays. The Euron stuff is coming. Um, I'm doing the video editing on it now, so within the week. <laughs> not Enron stuff. That's a that's a political podcast that I'm not going to do. Euron Part 1 is coming in about a week, though, yeah. Goodbye. Don't forget to drink alcohol. There you go, Jackie. Don't drink water. Fish fornicate in it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Jay. And if I don't know if anybody caught this, but Pink Floyd, <clears throat> learning to fly. We are learning to fly today. That's what Bran is doing, learning to fly. The stream is two hours and eight minutes, and we're getting ready to wrap it up. We're taking last call for questions. Oh, yeah, Gray Area is going to be joining me and Quinn for an RLJ Winds of Winter preview very soon. So Gray will be hanging out. And I'm supposed to jump on her Obsidian uh, Nights podcast at some point, perhaps for uh, Eddard's Tower of Joy Dream. We're talking about that. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Worldwide Warrior. Hey there, patron supporter. Yeah, I, I still owe some nicknames. If I owe you a nickname, uh, yeah, I'll be getting to that very soon. Yeah, it'll actually be LML and Quinn and Gray Area, all three of us, to talk about RLJ. So there you go. That's going to be fun. 
Um, and no, I am not aware of what is a book series that is as good as A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, there are many other series that use symbolism. Uh, you know, Lord of the Rings, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. Wheel of Time definitely does. Uh, but I don't know that anything does quite what A Song of Ice and Fire does. Telling, I often tell people that um, A Song of Ice and Fire, as if George had hid the major stories of the Silmarillion, the major world-building stories of the past, inside of Lord of the Rings via symbolic parallels. That is what George has done by giving us all of this long night story hidden through symbolism inside of the main story. He doesn't even have to write a Silmarillion about the long night and Azor High and Night's King because by the time he finishes with the book series, we're going to have that whole story in parallel. So that is off the charts. I see people recommending Terry Goodkind. I haven't read him, but I'm sure that is a good recommendation. The RLJ is happening soon. I just have to coordinate the timing with Gray. We'll try to put it together in the next couple weeks, I would say. Let me be is recommending First Law. That's cool. And, oh, RLJ. Uh, so, no, that's mm, the RLJ debunking, like debunking the non RLJ theories. That was a threat that I made last stream. I have no immediate plans to actually do that. I'm having Gray Area on with Quinn, <clears throat> we're going to talk about all the ways in which RLJ, which is true, all the ways in which it will be revealed and how it will affect the plot. Because in the on the TV show, it was very disappointing. John's Targaryen identity was only used to drive a political wedge between John and Danny. Uh, John and Danny didn't share kinship. Um, John rode the dragon before thinking he was a Targaryen and they didn't like Danny didn't like welcome him more after he was a dragon and teach him about the dragons. And like, it was crap. It was total crap. The only way they used it was to, as a threat to Danny's claim to the throne. And in the books, I believe it is going to be much different in the books. I believe they will share kinship and a, a found family. I believe that John will connect to his dragon legacy will affect his identity. His self identity is something that's had some holes in it and has been evolving the whole time. <clears throat> so, there's a lot of ways in which RLJ will affect the plot. And that's what we're going to talk about with Gray Quinn, because it's a winds of winter prediction and preview episode. So we're trying to predict like how it's going to be revealed and how it will affect the plot when it's revealed. So that will be fun. The debunking thing. I, I really don't want to do that. That will be something I'll be forced to do, but we'll see. The, the, the N plus a equals J people have been sending me super chats, which I consider a very sporting way to poke the poke the dragon pull the dragon's tail so as long as we keep it fun like that i'm always down for talking about conspiratorial theories and counterintuitive theories and you know i have a place in my heart for conspiracy theorists so it's all good fun and games all right guys so it looks like all the questions are in i don't see any any more coming in let me just check my email one more time and it looks like uh, yes, uh, there we go. It looks like we're all caught up. So thank you very much, guys. It's been a wonderful stream. I really appreciate all the paypal.me mythical astronomy, um, either, whether during the stream or after the stream and appreciate all the subs climbing lately. We're climbing towards 30,000. And so when we get to 30,000, we can do a YouTube subscriber thing, which is a little extra fun daily that you'll see soon. And like I said, I will be back soon. I'm not sure when I'll be streaming again, maybe this weekend, maybe next week. Um, it'll probably be Weird Compendium 10, unless I have a different idea. And Euron will be out in a week, too. So there you go. Thanks, all my mods. You guys are great. And I will see you again very soon.